Nobody cares what it's about. Who the hell is this to zombie takeout anyway? Hello and welcome to episode 400 of Zombie Takeout, the B-Moving Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And I typically don't say the episode number since we went to YouTube, but I figured this time I really should, because again, 400. Four damn hundred episodes. Mm -hmm. Would have been here in the summer, but you know, extenuating circumstances. (laughs) Oh my god. But that's a good thing because it allowed me to find this week's movie, which we'll get to, but we do have a little bit of listener submitted first, or feedback. Um, Patrick Leany II on Facebook, uh, on the trailer for this week's movie, said, congrats on the 400th episode. Uh, Thank you, Patrick. And Bodo left us a voicemail. John Scotto, Boto. Congratulations on the big 400. I was not able to watch the movie. I'm sure you've may have already recorded your review of it, but love you guys. You guys are the best. And hopefully we can be around for 400 more. Might take 10 and a half years, but maybe we'll get there eventually. Love you guys. You guys are the best. Bye. Uh, yeah. Yeah, This it was tough getting this one together, honestly. Yeah, um, I don't know about the... F- 400 more thing um hmm. <laughs> considering it took us a decade to get here it did didn't it yeah. my god 10 years to do 400 episodes mm. but you know well that's that with the four month hiatus like recently and i think if i recall we took like a better part of a year off in 2009 after my computer went belly up oh yeah I moved a couple, well, and I'm about to do so again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) we're also facing another little hiatus, probably not for months. Um, Do we just want to say this is it for the year, or do we want to risk it and maybe (sighs) try to get one more out? If we we can get the wherewithal to get something together next month, we sure as hell will try, but... um, There is a good chance this will be it for the year. Yeah, I'd say it's a good chance that we, unfortunately, cannot uh, Mm -hmm. do more this year. Which is kind of okay, because Bandmade's coming out on December 11th, which is a Wednesday, <laughs> the new Bandmade album. By the way, and this is a hearing thing, but, but I'll just mention, that our latest single was produced by Tony Visconti. Cool. Bowie's producer. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, their, their album's coming out on a Wednesday, and that would be difficult for me. Um, and, you know, um, the, new Star, the new Star Wars is coming out on a Thursday. I already got tickets for it. So, yeah, it might be best if we don't do that. anything next yeah. month. Um, anyway, finally, without any further ado, on to this week's movie, which is from 1974, Phantom of the Paradise. And, of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by the Juicy Fruits. When sha aren't quite annoying enough, get the Juicy Fruits. I think Wrigley's gonna sue. <laughs> uh, and also brought to you by uh, Brian De Palma's Time Machine. Want to find out what's going to happen in the world of music for the next 20 years? <laughs> Take a ride in Brian De Palma's Time Machine. Oh, yeah. Um, in addition to what we were discussing, which we'll get to, I think he also may have invented goth. Yes. Yes. I I, I, my, I mean, I was kind of on the fence about this movie until the undeads came on. <laughs> <laughs> and then my, my brain's fucking just hit the back window here yeah i had already bought the movie by that point (laughs) all right so we we pretty much have a telling of the the phantom of the opera well we have this you know plucky songwriter who's a really earnest you kind of think he's like an elton john type of person i almost thought he was warren zevon himself or or maybe a, a bad ray charles impression that went on way too long yeah and uh he's you know, playing his singer-songwriter stuff, and uh, well, this is about the time of Elton John, so mm-hmm. I think I, I definitely certainly, think certainly a factor, and you know, Jimmy Webb, and um, oh, um, not Leon Redbone, there's Leon Russell. Mm. There's a lot of guys, you know, piano player, singer types that they borrowed from. <laughs> Takes a Leon Redbone, anyway. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, there is, of course, the evil uh, impresario. Um, by the name of Swan, who uh, hears him 
uh, doesn't like his look or, or his, I don't know what he doesn't like about him exactly. But he's just, just not marketable. Yeah, he's just not marketable. So, he, you know, which is kind of absurd because, of course, what is marketable mm-hmm. at the time? Yeah, but Elton the John. <laughs> the this is before MTV. Piano. But anyway, he, he decides that uh, he could take this music and market it much better. And uh, so he steals it and he... Uh, quote unquote auditions women and of course that's where we meet our uh ingenue uh mm. phoenix who um uh, they they were rather impre- impressed by her dance moves for some reason <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of funny i'm like well i think really, they were uh, mostly impressed with her voice which legitimately was good but yes yeah the yes. physical part of her performance eh. yes. so <laughs> So uh, she's, of course, uh, going to be the next big thing, and um, they. But this uh, this songwriter will not give up. He's trying to get credit or get at least this done decently or to his uh, standards. But uh, he keeps getting pushed away more and more violently until he is arrested. And uh, but fear not. Sing Sing is a place one can escape from easily. Uh, after uh, they pull your teeth out to make sure you don't get any infections. Yeah. And uh, when he does escape, he goes to destroy the record uh, pressing plant. And uh, that is where his terrible disfigurement that we know that the, the fans are known for uh, happens. Yeah. Uh, when he comes out, he uh, grabs some uh, costume, a uh, metal helmet, black cape, and some black leather, and uh, we tend to hear him breathing a lot through it. And there ends up being this black box on his chest. Yeah. This movie, again, was 74. Yeah, that is, as you watch this movie, and, you know, first, you know, it's not good, you know, and you're thinking, huh, this is rough. Then you realize, wait a minute, this was 1974. <laughs> this is before Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Before Star Wars, and there are sh- before the Rocky Horror Picture Show, the movie anyway. Um, before Bauhaus. And I tell you, they, they go into like Swan's domain. And if you didn't think, you know, I mean, the white and black light that's used, you kind of start thinking you're on the Death Star for a mm-hmm. bit in some scenes. The, all right, so the uh, he's now the Phantom, of course. The Paradise is the park that Swan is looking to open up the, the, with, of theater. course, this... You said park. Right. We don't want to be reminded of Phantom of the Park. I thought it wasn't... Oh, is that what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of Phantom of the Park. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a music hall, a theater, whatever you want to call it. Okay, all right. So it was a theater, and he was looking to open it with this new uh this new ingenue sing- actually no he uh decides to because uh the phantom wants this woman to sing his stuff he decides to be spiteful and find pretty much literally a meathead <laughs> named beef to sing this stuff for him and to uh, just take whatever license you want with it i think he was digging at robert plant do you? Oh yeah, of course. And and <laughs> beef also maybe meatloaf. Yeah, that was the weird thing too. Was meatloaf really meatloaf before that? That's what I was wondering. Also, the Paradise Theater that caught my attention because I actually do like Sticks, and you know they have an album called Paradise Theater. There's actually a theater in Chicago called the Paradise Theater, apparently, or there was. There may have been. Yeah. We had a lot of big theaters here. So I, that just happened to catch my attention for the Sticks reference. Um, but yeah, but yeah. Um, long before Sticks, too, though, isn't it? Um, before the album, the album was seventy one. Uh, I don't. I, I think the band's been together since like the early seventies, late sixties. You know, but, I did not know Sticks were to, Sticks were together for that long. Yeah. They formed in like six the late sixties. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, um, Beef was basically the typical glam rock guy. Um, I double checked New York Dolls. They actually got together in seventy one. Yeah. So and and Bolin around the same year kind of started glam rock. So 
he was a few years into glam rock, but that's still pretty early for a movie to be featuring it. Uh, well, honestly, it kind of was peaking at mm-hmm. around this year. Like, yeah, he it was, was in kind just of a... at the, the right time. Yeah. So uh, Usually movies are a little bit late to that. The Phantom, of course, threatens Beef with his life to not sing his songs. And Beef does the, the understandable, logical thing <laughs> Runs by, away. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> but, of course... Uh, the swan has some muscle that, uh, that of course convinces him to stay, uh, his faithful, uh, sidekick, um, Philbin and who is, resembles meatloaf an awfully lot. Yeah. I think, um, Ra- um, Eddie's appearance in the movie was, t- was borrowed from Philbin at least, at least early in the film. Well, there was the whole, yeah, there's the whole rockabilly thing that both of them were going on. But then again, a- and and it's funny because I thought that the opening Rod Sterling thing was just an impression no, of Rod it's Sterling. Sterling. <laughs> I couldn't believe that it really was him. Yeah. And uh, but it, it talks about just this nostalgia wave and just the, the whole fifties nostalgia thing back then mm-hmm. was just uh, overwhelming. Well, if you think about it, it was only twenty years earlier. 15, right. really. Um, right. It, it would be like us being nostalgic for the 90s. Which right. Which we kind of are. If you're of that age, you are nostalgic for your 20s teens. You know? But we are nowhere near as nostalgic about the 90s as they were about the 60s and 50s <laughs> back in the 80s and 70s. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about the most watched show, or what, some of the most watched shows in the years. 70s. You know, oh. Happy Days. Yeah. And I was then, thinking yeah, 60s then, with Wonder Years, but yeah. And then in the 80s, you had the Wonder Years. Right. And in the 90s, you had that 70s show. But that really wasn't like a, no. as big a show as, you know, Happy Days. Mm-hmm. That's Happy a good Days point. Was yeah. Fucking yeah, the 50s mon- a thing in the 70s was a little over the top. And you had everybody working a 50s angle into their act, you know. Mm-hmm. Bowie and Elton John, right, sure. they were all doing this 50s nostalgia thing. And you're just kind of like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway they they, they do poke f- a, a lot of fun at that <laughs> mm-hmm. uh yeah with uh, this band that is yeah featured in different uh well actually they're featured as three different bands but it's really the same band first you have the 50s nostalgia band the, the juicy fruits then you have the 60s nostalgia band which he saw coming because I, I don't yeah. think there was a, as much of a 60s nostalgia thing in the 70s. No, no. Well, it was as surf rock, was. too, which I don't know if anybody's the really 80s. that nostalgic for surf rock except for like Full House. Um, but he calls, you know, the beach bums the, or something, the beach bums played by the same three guys. Boys. Yeah, they played by the same three guys. And then when they finally do open the paradise, and then it gets real interesting because the opening act. They become back as the undeads. And I painted, my... you know, in, in corpse paint, sounding it's a lot dancing. like Bauhaus. It's fucking guar. It's fucking, I mean, they're literally, they're, they're chopping off limbs and stuff mm-hmm. like guar. That's guar's whole act. Yeah. It, it but, was very, very goth in it, right, it's 74. You're right. I was like... I, Am I like? Did they do like a re-edit of this and come back with this? Bauhaus formed in '78. Yes, and I mean, they are basically credited for inventing goth. Right. The, the, the it, this was just shocking. This <laughs> really was. <laughs> and so, the Palmer's musical Time Machine. Right. So of course, uh, all hell breaks loose because Beef is the the main act. And he does perform this song, and he has uh, Phoenix as his but one of his background singers. When finally, of course, the Phantom makes good on his promise, and of course, kills him in the most dramatic fashion mm-hmm. possible in front of the entire audience. And then they somehow convince Phoenix to come out to perform, well, thinking that they're appeasing the Phantom since he's threatened to uh, not have her, and you know. They probably right. He probably would have laid the whole fucking theater to waste mm-hmm. if he, she didn't. Yeah. So I, she... I was waiting for her to sing something about cards for sorrow, cards for pain. Because <laughs> that ending was the so, show. 
That was the fourth yeah. half. Yeah, it pretty much was. It was. It was the the uh, camera straight down. Mm-hmm. The the world was spinning. Stop the world! I want to get off. Mm-hmm. That's the comeback line. Yeah, and uh, hilarity ensues. Been a lot. God knows I've tried you. Um, yeah. So yeah, hilarity ensues, and and again that beginning with Serling, which blew my mind because I had in my notes originally it was a hell of a Serling impression. And then I'm looking through Wikipedia. Wait, cameo from Rod Serling. Holy shit. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that Serling thing was rough. <laughs> and Oh, that was him. <laughs> and then we get the first taste of the Juicy Fruits. Really made me wonder what we ever saw in Shanana. I just read a story not that long ago about Shanana and Woodstock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and how it was actually Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, yeah. that uh, brought them in and uh, they had never really performed in front of anything <laughs> larger than like a bar uh-huh. <laughs> like they never performed more than like maybe a few dozen people <laughs> <laughs> and instead they're out there at Woodstock with all these hippies just staring going what the fuck and it was because <laughs> somebody cancelled but I can't remember who it was or somebody backed out of the show and they needed to fill us yeah. out might have been the who it was somebody big um, yeah it might have been the who actually <laughs> But so, you know, they do that, and then we get Winslow singing one of his songs at a piano. Winslow becomes, the guy who becomes a phantom. And he's doing this this Ray Charles head move, and it just goes on way too long. Right. I'm kind of, I kind of get nervous here, because I'm like, you know, <laughs> this, this is not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm doubting this movie for a very long time. Um, but See, one thing you can't deny about it, though. Is that this is visually a really good looking film. Oh yeah, yeah. And it won me over in the next section because, you know, Felbin the side the, the man the business guy for Swan pulls him aside and says, We'd like to use your songs. And then we have um Winslow Chase trying to chase down Swan to make work a deal out, and Swan's just of giving him the complete brush off. Yeah. And it was the classic over eager artist trying to get their song heard. How about Mr. Rainbow Connections? Everything. Mr. Rainbow Connections' first line being the uh, other f bomb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's the bad guy, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was in drag, but you know. <laughs> um, the overlapping voices when Winslow walked into the audition were a bit much, because we have a bunch of prospective singers, female singers, do, performing his song. This is that when he finds out it was stolen. And yeah, I think that's kind of when I think found myself being sucked in mm-hmm. to the actual plot and feeling for Winslow and yeah. just like, <laughs> wow, okay. So he gets ejected from the theater and thrown in jail. And again, they're going to pull his teeth to avoid infection. <laughs> he ends up with these metal teeth, escapes, gets disfigured in the record pressing plant an actual record pressing plant by the way yeah it was my rigged so it wouldn't hurt him but there was some kind of malfunction i mean obviously he didn't get disfigured but it did didn't quite work didn't quite go to plan i believe my father worked with those back in the day i oh, mean wow. yeah i don't you know i should ask him which record company he actually worked for because mm-hmm. it's a long time since i've heard the story okay um and and the the effect after he got disfigured was really nice like the the effects makeup. Oh yeah, uh, looked great for seventy four, and then he emerges, and we just see his perspective, which again, Remy. Yeah, um, and we hear this heavy breathing, very Darth Vader. <laughs> have we mentioned this was edited by Paul Hirsch yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the we same have? guy that did. I thought that. we did that off the before we oh, started. Okay, maybe maybe it was off air. <laughs> we had too much of a conversation off air before this. Yeah, I had some time to kill. Um, but yeah, edited by the same guy who did New Hope. So, and of course, De Palma, Lucas, Hirsch. I mean, they're all college film school buddies. Mm-hmm. You know, Coppola was in that crowd too. Right. Uh, so it, it isn't that crazy that some ideas kind of got passed around a bit. Uh, but I'll tell you the moment that this film really won me over, and it's kind of like the scene in Lebowski where, uh, you know, he says he hates the Eagles, so the Rolling Stone guy was mm-hmm. like, manager was like, 
I'm in. You can use it. Right. <laughs> was when the beach bums came out. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was getting the feeling there that the satire was hitting a little too close to the bone. <laughs> <laughs> like Ishtar. Like Ishtar had that whole, you know, it's a bomb, it's the worst movie ever. I think largely because of what it had to say. Yeah. And for them to skewer 50s nostalgia and then the Beach Boys and car culture, mm-hmm. that that's... That was too much to ask they <laughs> ran, a middle um, American audience. They ran registration and, and um, what was it? Um, oh, what was the rhyme with registration? Oh, um, I can't remember, but they actually were the registration and then like something about parole. Like it, the, the lyrics were just so ridiculously on point. Yes. Um, the, I just wasn't sure about all the looking into camera. There are lots oh. of, a lot of moments where, where the actors look straight into the camera in this movie. Yeah, that was really, I, I mean, I don't understand the whole, like, Philbin doing the exposition talk into the camera like that. <laughs> Straight into the camera. I mean, I kind of appreciate that they went there, but it was very unsettling, which I think is why they went there. Um, also loved when um, Swan was tweaking um, Winslow's voice. They end up working together. Um, yeah. Obviously, Swan's going to screw him over again. But he's trying to, you know, help him recover from the incident and trying to fix his voice because he can't speak afterwards because his throat was pretty much crushed by the record pressing machine. Yeah. Um, and he's got this black box on his chest and this black suit and it's it's Velvator. But he's in this room with this organ singing this song. Uh, incidentally, that was an actual um, studio that was filmed at the record plant in New York. I think it's in New York. No, no. Um, Actually, I'm not sure if it's in New York or LA. Um, real actual recording studio. Um, all of those knobs were a um, custom built synthesizer called Tonto, which still exists to this day. That wasn't just set dressing. Wow. So I mean, a synthesizer that looked like that back then. Damn. Mm. It was that was a Moog. That, that Moogs were all patch cores now. Um, yeah. Or Moogs, sorry. Um, oh, by the way. Um, <laughs> De Palma considered Shannon for the Juicy Fruits, but he found them too difficult to work for work with and fired them and rejected them. Um, oh, this was much better using the same band oh, yeah, for yeah. all three. All absolutely. three. Yeah, um, I love that. But when he's you know tweaking uh, Winslow's voice at the um, mixing board, if you know how a mixing board works, that's hilarious. I went to audio engineering school, so I know how all that works. And he's, you know, adjusting all these things, you know, horizontally across the board. That's not how they work. (laughs) I think it was just a little subtle joke for people who actually know how to work a mixing board. I mean, it's been a long time. And I think the mixing board I used back in, wow, we're talking like 30 years ago. Yeah, that was a small little thing. But yeah, same principle. Yeah. Uh, you know, you each each um, horizontal, you know, each vertical section is one track, is one thing that's coming in. Yeah. You know, if you go across horizontally, you're controlling another input. And but he only had the one input he was messing with. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, hearing Swan's song played by in, in multiple genres was interesting because yes. or, or Winslow, sorry. At one point, Swan is auditioning performers. This is where he finds beef. And you're hearing the same snippet of the, of the song played by a soul group and, you know, um, a doo-wop group and, you know, yada yada onto a, a, you know, the glam rock singer. And it was just interesting hearing the same song interpreted different ways. And I love the lyrics to the Phantom's theme, particularly the chorus. Um, um, but I've been, oh, I can't remember the lyric. I should have put it in my notes, but I, all the good guys and the bad guys that I've been, you know, the angels and the demons. <laughs> right. Love that chorus. Um, and oh, by the way, how did Winslow escape that electronic room to threaten Beef? Because he was walled in by Swan. Well, there's the scene where they they came back to the hallway to find the guards dead. Oh, okay. I, I missed that. Rick's just all on the floor. Mm. <laughs> so he somehow just busted through that wall. Okay. They just didn't show him bust through the wall. Right, they just right. showed their after result. They now, here's skip the real over mystery. a few things. The real mystery is how the fuck did De Palma 
get those shots with those mirrors mm. without getting any crew in the mirrors. Very carefully. I mean, th- I mean, he did this multiple times, by the way, in this movie, mm-hmm. where he did like head-on shots with mirrors in the background of the shot, and then I didn't see any ca- any crew, no. not a single crew, and it was like he was daring us, <laughs> yeah, because he did it then multiple times. I'm just sitting here each time he did it, like he did it again. What the fuck, he did it again. <laughs> And I love that the setting and the story allow it to be a musical without anybody singing for no reason. <laughs> well, there were a lot of 70s musicals like that where it was, you know, in, in the music, you know, yeah. business. Like, what was the one, Get Crazy, we did? Well, yeah, true, true. <laughs> where everybody did Manish Boy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's just nice because I'm not a musical person. And, and you know, having somebody sing their dialogue for no reason just annoys me. We were just commenting that earlier in the week, how, like, the genre of, or the whole entire art form of opera is pretty much, you know, dead. <laughs> like, dying in our lifetimes, along with, and, you know, ballet, mm. too, but mm, most, mostly opera. And, well, and at least opera, it's, it's awesome. So at well, least right. the conceit is consistent. You know, with a musical, some of it's spoken, some of it's sung, and they sing for no reason. And it just never connected with me. The so, the dialogue sets up the song in between. But, mm. it, yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's been done. There, there's some occasions where it's been done well. But, yeah, for the most part, it's been done to death, mm. you could say. So at least this, the, the story and the setting of this movie sets up a reason for people to sing. And of course, opera in itself is just like an athletic, mm-hmm. oh, insane, yeah. insane thing. Like just marveling at the ability of these people to belt out shit oh, yeah, like that. <laughs> but much like orchestral music, it's it's becoming, um, it's it's con- it's considered a relic. Well, the orchestra it's not kept can fresh. It, the orchestra can at least survive because it can be used in other art in art other art forms. Yes, like film scores. Mm-hmm. That that at least has that chance yeah. to do it. But you know, um, as soon as you know, with ballet, um, as soon as modern dance, modern ballet has happened, ballet was kind of classical ballet was kind of on the way out. But then dance altogether as an art form just. It doesn't exist like it used to, you know, well, and no, it's kind it of did. sad to see that, you well, know, we have the TV shows now, the TV shows, you know, so you think you can dance and, you know, world, whatever the one with Jennifer Lopez was recently. I don't know. Do, do those really save the art form? I don't as know, well? but they're interesting. I, I like dance. I like watching it. I'm, like, I'm fascinated by any art form that I don't actually do because I do quite a few of them. Hmm. So I have a particular respect for the ones I do. I have no talent for, um, Anyway, back to Phantom of the Paradise. Um, there's another nod to Rocky. Or I can't even say nod to Rocky. It's just, right. It's we a... don't know if Rocky took from this. Yeah. We um, really don't know. After they're leaving the theater after the, the show, um, he he pulls, uh, Winslow gets Phoenix up on the roof of the ingenue and to try to you know, tell her that, that Swan is going to take advantage of her and blah, blah, blah. And she... Makes you, they have an argument. She goes back to the car. She, she tells them he's on the roof. And then there's a shot of the roof that looks exactly like the fucking Frankenstein place. <laughs> and Even then... Sewing, um, him, sewing beef together. It was so magenta looking. Yeah. yeah. Um, Winslow's suicide attempt um, mirrors the opening song because it's about a guy who committed suicide to you know, sacrifice himself to save a girl. Yeah, they they he does a nice job of foreshadowing different things about you know the Faust, you mm-hmm. know. <laughs> and then, do we want to get to the twist? Do we want to reveal the twist? Um, yeah, well, I don't even know if I saw it as a twist. Well, we find out that Swan actually is Faust. Yeah, he literally sold his soul. And I mean, it's hinted to enough, you know, when he. They they kind of come out and say it without saying it, revealing it fully when, mm-hmm. you know, um, when the Phantom goes to kill him. Right. You know, and he well, says, yeah. well, that that's I'm when you find out there's something going on. I think he says, I've, I have a deal with someone else. I'm, or a, 
I'm under contract That's too. It, yeah. Um, you know, um, so Winslow tries to kill himself. It doesn't work. It just seals itself up when, uh, um, Swan finds him and says, you know, as long as I'm alive, you're alive. As long as I have to be under contract, you're under contract. Um, and so you pretty much know how this thing is going to go down in the end. He you know, find, from that Winslow point. finds the uh, video of uh, Swan actually selling his soul. Somehow the devil in the mirror showed up on film. Hey, was it a video or was it a film? It was a film. But yeah, yeah. it was actually a real. <laughs> I was going to say, Brian De Palma's time machine does not extend to uh, that kind of technology. Well, no, it was I, I, it was video <laughs> footage. You know, it was on it's a, it was on a reel. Um, <laughs> I thought that whole thing was just beautifully campy because then they go to a bunch of other things that were apparently filmed for some reason. Paul Williams looks a lot like Mickey Rooney, mm-hmm. and the whole last act was just this beautiful chaos. Yeah. Just this this ridiculous, you know, glam rock song playing while just everything falls apart. Uh, yeah, I mean, the undeads. That's all you really need to know. Well, this was after the undeads. This was after he oh, finds oh, it, you're right. you know, just one song playing while he just. It was basically Swan's destruction, um, and <laughs> and of course Winslow's because they're connected in that way. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm curious about why um, when Winslow's mask came off when he died, where was the makeup? Because <laughs> he had this black makeup on, you know, under the mask to kind of hide himself. And oh, and wh- yet there was makeup on. I don't remember him with black makeup, though. Yeah, whenever you saw him take the mask off, occasionally he had, like, black eye- black circles around his eyes and such to, to kind of darken his skin, you know, so you didn't see it in the make- in the- behind the mask. Maybe he just didn't get enough sleep that night. Well, it's a common technique. I mean, if you've ever seen <laughs> uh, Peter Mayhew with the Chewbacca mask <laughs> off, you know, he's got the black circles. Um, yeah. And why was Phoenix so broken up about his death when they met like twice? <laughs> they met at the audition when he first talked to her, and then when he pulled her up on the roof, that was it. They didn't like have a they connection. They do try to um, shoehorn a uh, love story in somehow, don't they? Yeah, I guess. I mean, it was more about his obsession with her, which again, fan of the opera, being obsessed with the singer, it was, you know. But she didn't, I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen the original Phantom, but she didn't really have any particular love for him, did she? I don't think um, so. I thought there was kind of a, a seduction, maybe. you know, that she was intrigued by okay, him, Okay, yeah, course. but maybe there was, but he had more time, you know. She met Winslow, like, twice before right. he died. <laughs> and that's true. The In the, uh, the Phantom of the Opera... Uh, I don't think she ever meets him before he gets disfigured. I don't think that right. happens. No, no, no. That's true. Yeah, he, she only sees him as the monster. Yeah. Whereas I, uh, maybe the Phantom was an yeah. improvement. <laughs> I <laughs> really this think case. this might be De Palma's best film. Yeah, you know, if you told me a few years ago that Dress to Kill... But, but <laughs> this, we would yeah. do both of these and I would be like, oh yeah, Phantom... <laughs> It would be much better than that. I would have thought you were crazy. <laughs> yeah, like, even if you Michael told Kane, me that, it's got, uh... if you told me I would hate Dress to Kill before I reviewed it, I would have said the same thing because I had very fond memories of the trailer and and the you know, little bits I'd seen here yeah. and there. Oh, uh, by the way, Sissy Spacek was was the set dresser on the film, <laughs> which is that's crazy itself too but yeah she was she was in with that crowd too she was uh, assisting her boyfriend at the time Jack Fisk who became her husband who was a production designer yeah she was a part of that whole scene um no sequels or remakes and nor should there be this needs to stand alone I I could see this as a Broadway production I think it's 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 perfect as it is Oh, of course yeah. it is, but I think more people should see this anyway. Yeah, fair and, point, fair point, yeah. Maybe a Broadway thing. And Although... You know, I, I don't know what, who... I mean, I don't think you need to do, like, a new music thing to it. You know, no. I think it, it works yeah, so in the genres they have. Keep it as it is and just don't worry about the, the shocking prescience of De Palma. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think he, he saw far enough into the future 
where I would be faithful to this, mm -hmm. but seeing this live would be fucking crazy. That's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially, especially if you, if you stage have it right. Winslow the Phantom, with, like actually if you climbing stage around it with shit coming into the audience and stuff. Oh yeah. my god, this would be nuts. And actually, you know, Winslow jumping around and climbing in the rafters while it's all going on. Yeah. yeah. On exactly. Friends. Dancers going everywhere. Sure. I loved it. I bought it. I'm, it's a five for me. Uh, I was I was pretty much on the fence for a lot of it because, I mean, the story is... <laughs> the story itself is kind of dicey and the acting it's, is dicey. It's Fast Beats Phantom of the Opera. But God damn it, it is so beautifully shot. I mean, you don't expect a movie like this to be this beautifully shot, even mm -hmm. if it is De Palma. Yeah. You're, expecting, you're expecting something closer to Brie. <laughs> and instead you get these tricks of like I'm going to shoot a mirror head on yeah. and you're not going to see a camera or lighting guy or boom guy uh, it's a four for me you got to see it and just, just for the undeads alone mm -hmm. <laughs> and just keep saying to yourself this was 1974 <laughs> this is like the, it's like a year after MASH debuted mm -hmm. I mean it's like, <laughs> like what the fuck alright so what have we learned Ah, uh, we learned that uh, De Palma had a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned to never let my personal desires influence my aesthetic judgment. Although I think I've done that in the past. Anyway, <laughs> that's it for Fan with a Paradise. Until next time, probably next year. Um, yeah. When we'll be reviewing, well, we have zombie cheerleading camp slated, but if it's the beginning of the year, we got to do something big. We'll work that out ahead of time. Yeah. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.